wonderful folks here for allowing us to, to be here. Um, sometimes, though, they are over at the Gatton School of Business and Economics, and um, so please join us there. They're stimulating sessions, all of them. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping announcements. You will, you are being asked by Stacy to please sign in. Uh, you will receive an evaluation at the end of the semester and that will ask you to please evaluate the session or sessions that you've attended. We have a whole roster of amazing upcoming sessions. And uh, next week will be very exciting. It will be right here. 12 to 1. It will be with successful early career researchers. It will be a panel sort of like this and they will be talking to you about the secrets of their success. They're from many different colleges around campus, fine arts, medicine, public health, um, arts and sciences, and they are incredibly successful as researchers. So we're really looking forward to that. But today, and all of these presentations, by the way, are on the VPR's website, um, al along with information about the next sessions and other sessions. So please visit the website and you'll get lots of information there. But today, we have a very, very special session um, with uh, starring Tanya Phillips and her colleagues. Tanya is um, the, uh, is helps to direct the senior associate director, is that right? Um, of the Office of Technology and Commercialization, OTC. Um, and she will be joined by her colleagues, as well as faculty members who, can you please mute your mic? Um, those of you who are listening at home, thank you. Um, and she will be joined by, by a number of different people who will come up here and be on the panel. So I'm going to let uh, Ms. Phillips talk to you a little bit and introduce some of her colleagues, so welcome. Thank you, Nancy. So uh, as Nancy said, I'm Tanya Phillips and I'm the Senior Associate Director for New Ventures and Alliances in the Office of Technology Commercialization. And our group is excited to be here today to talk to you about what we do uh, in terms of faculty spin-out companies. So I've got my colleague Eric Hartman who's going to talk to you next and he's going to give an overview of the office. And then and Eric is the um, Associate Director for New Ventures. And then we have Emmanuel Smith who's going to talk to you about some of the programs. And Emmanuel is a, a New Ventures Manager. So without further ado, I'm going to let Eric talk to you. I will come back up and moderate the panel and so as you are thinking about questions as time goes on I'll open that up to the audience also. Thank you Tanya. So I understand that the session today is called So You Think You Want to Be an Entrepreneur. You think you do until you do but that's not right. We're gonna help, we're gonna help you really want to and we're gonna help you understand why. We're gonna help you be successful, that's our goal. So, a couple things, housekeeping matters we wanna do just to kick off here. First of all, we are recording. Uh, so in addition to the Zoom that you uh, are seeing, uh, we are recording separately from that. Uh, so as we do things today, we're all gonna be using microphones. We'll ask that uh, as we ask questions of the panel and you will be having a chance to do that, so please prepare your questions now. Um, uh, we will ask that you use the microphone so that we can record your questions as well. Uh, but we wanted to let everybody know that. Um, so, and then I want to just begin with a, an overview of the office. So before we really dig into this, so you want to be an entrepreneur. So our office uh, is the Office of Technology Commercialization. And the goal of our office is really to help protect and commercialize IP assets that belong to the university. So things that are coming out of UK research and helping to move those things uh, from the point of disclosure to our office uh, to protecting those assets the best way that uh, is feasible uh, under, under the law so that we can protect uh, the IP assets and then move those into a commercialization point uh, and whatever that might look like. So uh, our, we have three groups within our office that are part of our team uh, that help to do that. So we have a, a group that works with uh, protecting the intellectual property and managing uh, that IP. We have a group that works with licensing and commercialization. Uh, and then we have our uh, New Ventures and Strategic Alliances group. Uh, all of us work together with the goal of helping you take your idea from disclosure to impact. 
So what does impact look like? Well, impact might be a valuable startup company. Impact might be uh, helping people in the, in the uh, in the economy, helping people uh, with health needs, helping create new materials, helping uh, solve problems in the marketplace, all of those things uh, would be categorized as impact. So there's multiple definitions of what that might look like, but ultimately what we want is we want to find a way to help you move that from an idea so that it can be successfully transferred uh, into the marketplace where it can actually help um, someone do something, right? That's our goal, right? Um, so. As we do that, um, and we've got slides, so that's me. <laughs> As we do that, what we often find is that we do it backwards. And so over the course of time, this process has been done kind of in a way that isn't the most efficient. And, and we call that the ready, fire, aim process. So obviously that doesn't make sense, right? We should be aiming before we fire. But when we think about commercialization, the thing that we hear, and this is, this just makes our day when we hear this. I'm, I'm being very facetious right now. Uh, when faculty members come and they say, yeah, we don't really want to do a startup, we just want to do SBIR, right? That's one of the favorite quotes that we get. That's, the, that's ready, fire, aim, and action. So how many people know what SBIR is? Yep, so most people do. I figured that most people are familiar with that. For those that don't know, that's a, a federal program that's available to small businesses to help commercialize IP and to help move IP into the marketplace. So the idea of the program is to do the things that, that I mentioned before, to take this idea and move it to impact. Uh, but um, you know, ultimately, we've got to do that in the right order for it to work. And so uh, what we're working with is trying to help you figure out how to get the steps in the right order and to do the things early on in the process that really maximize the value and maximize the impact of the work that you do. So some of the work that, that we work with you on is things that can be done here within the university. And we have a number of programs uh, that are working with you uh, still here within the university. And there's a possibility, and, and a lot of the IP that comes into our office actually never leaves the university except to the eventual strategic corporate partner uh, that's gonna take that and commercialize it. So uh, in that case, if we can work with you on moving things through the university processes and our programs are helpful in trying to help you uh, commercialize that IP to the point that a commercial partner is interested, um, then we can go right to the commercial partner and, and our team helps you do that. Um, in some cases, as we talk to the commercial partner, they might say, you know, we might be interested if. If you could show this, if you could do this, if you could remove this risk, if you could demonstrate that uh, the technology really can do what it is that you say that it can do, then we may be interested. So in those cases, there may be a point where we have to say, we've done all we can do within the scope of the university. Uh, we need to move this out of the university to continue that process of commercializing and de-risking this technology, and we do that through a startup, okay? And a startup, brings a little, a number of different factors to play. It brings to play the, the ability for outside resources with capital, either with grant funding with SBIR, potential investors, strategic partners, all kinds of things like that. Uh, and there's a number of other things that can happen with a startup too that, that really kind of facilitate or, or uh, make necessary the need to move outside the university to really continue this commercialization process. But ultimately our goal is always to continue to look at this corporate partner, who is it that's gonna buy this, who is it that's going to take this to the market? Because we as a, a startup and certainly as a university are not going to be the one that's delivering the final product, okay? And even with a startup, we're looking at the startup as a, a means to an end. We're trying to get to the point of an eventual commercial partner wanting to take that uh, product. So uh, the programs that we have, the coaching that we provide, the resources that we have available are all trying to flip this and put it in the right order so that we can go from ready to, to aim to fire. I've said it backwards way too many times. Okay, so uh, as I said, there's um, programs that we offer and here in just a second, Emmanuel's gonna come up and talk uh, about one of those programs and, and a couple of the other ones as well, but one uh, really key program that we offer to do that. 
Before I do that, I want to just tell you about a couple of resources that are available to you. Uh, in addition to our office being available to you, and you can come and talk to us, and we're happy to work with you, um, you know, on individual basis and, and other ways. There are a couple of ways that you can engage uh, with us and engage with other entrepreneurs. Uh, and so one of those is an event called SBIR Connect slash SBIR Unplugged. Uh, it just went through a name change. But SBIR Connect is a, is a monthly program that meets uh, among people that do SBIR work. So people that either have SBIRs or are interested in SBIR, support SBIR, uh, and startups of deep tech type companies like what you would be doing. Um, and so that's a monthly meetup that comes and talks specifically about that. And so that's something that we can provide information to you about how to access those. Uh, and then the other one is even more often because once a month, that's just way too long. Entrepreneurs move too quick. We can't wait a month. We got to do it every week. So we do our weekly startup breakfast. And actually it was this morning at Deviate Kitchen and we do that every Wednesday morning. So if you want to come out and join us, we are there every Wednesday morning from 7 to 9, maybe a little bit late if we don't have a lunch appointment like today. Um, and so we would love for you to come out and talk to us there. We typically average 15 to 20 people, and we're there every single week. Uh, holidays, snow, sleet, rain, we're there. So uh, you decide you want to come out and talk to somebody, you have questions, uh, we're there to talk. So. No further ado, I'll invite Emmanuel up. So Emmanuel is program manager with our new ventures team, and he is going to talk to us about UK Excel and several other programs that we offer. Good. How's everybody doing? Good. All right, let's see here. Well, that's me. All right. All right, so UK Excel. <clears throat> so as Eric stated, this is kind of one of our flagship programs uh, out of our office. Okay. So what UK Excel essentially is, it's a 90-day program. Um, that is focused on challenging your idea or your innovation, right? So what you know, so whatever commercialization track that might be, as you work into advanced tech technology, you could say, hey, it's SBIR. I want to create a startup. Or I want to license uh, this technology. Uh, this is where uh, UK Excel uh, can uh, can fit within that. Okay. So one thing about the uh, uh, program that is, you know, it's designed to test your hypothesis. So you come to our office and you say, hey. Uh, Emmanuel, I got this idea, I got this innovation, and I'm trying to, and I think it has commercialization potential, okay? So initially, my thought is, you know, I like the word I think, right? Versus, you know, the I knowers. I like the I thinkers, okay? So when they say, I think this has commercialization uh, potential versus, well, I know this has commercialization potential because I talked to my buddy at Aztec 301, and he said, this is just the best, this, best thing since sliced bird, and everybody's gonna, is going to pay for it. So, uh, what does design do, like I said, is to test your hypothesis on why you think there's commercialization potential uh, with your technology, okay? So uh, one of the things that uh, also, uh, you know, whenever you're focusing on your technology and you bring that commercialization focus in there, you know, you're, you know, you're researchers or you're scientists, so you've been on this path. For, you know, for the longest. You say, well, I've done my research and I know this has some viability, but now I'm, I'm putting in this commercialization component. So now that's going to take you on a whole nother, whole nother path, okay? So when you start talking commercialization, and it's a hard pill to swallow sometimes when you put all this legwork and all this effort in research and you start talking commercialization, um, you know, it's no longer about your technology anymore. When you're on that commercialization path, it's no longer about your technology. It's about what your technology can do to fulfill or need or a problem or a pain point for, uh, by your customers, right? So it's no longer about us. And so this is what uh, UK Excel is designed to do. We, you know, we give you the tools and the resources in order for you to go through all that because there's a lot of different things. I know we have some participants here that have been through UK Excel before, and we've kind of changed uh, the program dynamics behind it, okay, which is more engaging, which is uh, so you're working within a cohort fashion, so you have other like-minded uh, individuals that are also trying to advance their technology and learn about the commercialization process of it because you know just essentially you know there are you know they're scientists there you know you got to, you know technology focus don't really know about the commercialization track or the business side of things so this is kind of gives you a way out of your comfort zone and also what it shows too uh, with the office is your commitment and your dedication as you as you work on advancing this technology because you know UK you know invests in you know invest in you as you go down this path so this is a great uh, resource uh, to have. 
All right. So uh, and you'll get, you know, feedback and discussion in regards to not only from us and the team within OTC, but also from your peers, because you might have some that have been down this road a little bit further, can be able to provide some additional um, information uh, as well as you move through the program. So I invite you, if you if you disclose and you're wanting to commercialize UK Excel, is kind of our flagship program uh, that is, uh, you know, that is, like I said, it's testing your hypothesis, right? All right. So from that, uh, we have some other additional programs, which I call like our value added, right? And everything kind of fits in with UK Excel. Okay, so we have our Catalyst Fund. So what essentially that is, the Catalyst uh, Fund is a proof of concept. It's a proof of concept uh, fund that is designed to bridge that gap between idea and discovery and commercialization, right? So you went through UK Excel and you've done all the work and you, and you got some take in regards to your customer. You say, hey, if I only can do X, Y, and Z, I've identified, they say, hey, if you can do with this material, or if you have this app that you can, that you can develop, we're in the money, right? So, you, you've, so this is where it comes in. You come and say, hey, well, I've identified a need. I've been to UK Excel. I'm going to keep plugging that in there. And I identified a need, and, and they're telling me if I'm able to do this, or I get the feedback from the SBIR, and they say, hey, if you're able to prove this, then we're good. So what that does, it bridges that gap. Because you might say, hey, I may not have the funding to do that. So this is where the catalyst funds come into play. That's where we help bridge that gap between idea and discovery and commercialization. Okay, so it's a, it's a small amount uh, award. Uh, it's up to $50,000, $5,000, uh, $50,000 per, per year. Uh, but it's, it's designed to help fulfill that need in order to get you further down that, that track of commercialization. All right, so our next thing is, is, our, is our MIR, which is our Mentors and Residents, okay? And that's exactly what it sounds. It's a, it's, it's a mentorship, okay? Yes, us within UK, you know, UK OTC, we have a lot of smart and intelligent individuals within our office that can provide a lot of good insight in regards to your technology. But, you know, we've identified that we're not the, the, the knowers of everything. Or we may not have the time necessarily to work uh, you know, on, on certain aspects. So this is where our mentors come in. So these are people that are highly specialized industry experts that are designed to answer these questions. So as you, as you advance your technology, and so you've got your framework and your, your life cycle, you're saying, hey, I got a check mark here. I'm able to do this. I have a pharma pharmaceutical or medical device. And uh, I know about the research, so I got the check mark. There. But then I see that I know it's going to be an FDA component, a part of that, right? I may not have the knowledge to do that. I, you know, FDA or regulatory is not my specialty, so I got a question mark here. Okay, so this is kind of where I, my mentors come into play. They're the ones designed out of Pacific to take those question marks and put them in the checks. Okay, all right. So, and this is and the MRs are not people to run your startups or submit your SBR application for you. These, you know, the SBRs are brought on board as you know as mentors with specific needs that you might have such as regulatory pathway and those type of things, all right? So it's a great uh, program uh, to utilize, um, you know, to help fulfill those needs that you might have and that's keeping you from moving forward within your uh, commercialization uh, track. All right, so then we have our uh, executive on rosters, and we were talking about this yesterday, <laughs> but being that February is still Valentine's, right? So this is still kind of like the Valentine's uh, month. And, uh, and you're saying, well, hey, what does XOR, executive on rosters, have to do with Valentine's? All right, essentially what that is, it's a, it's a match.com uh, service designed to match you. Um, you know, so, so this is designed for our later stage uh, startups. So they have, reached a, they have reached a point where they're like, hey, we're ready to launch this company. And they may say, hey, well, I don't, I'm not interested in being a CEO. I don't have the skill sets or, or uh, I'm needing some help or I don't have the time or I'm not able to. Can you match me with someone that have those skill sets? Okay, so uh, the XOR is, is, is kind of like a, a matchmaking service for executive level talent to help come in and, pro and provide that, uh, that need that you might have in order to launch your company even further. So it's a, it's a great program, and, it's, and there's about 18 universities. Uh, there's a Midwest and a Southeast uh, XOR, but it's about 18 universities uh, that's a part of that platform that are, that are doing kind of like the same, uh, the same uh, format. And I think with UK is the only, um, is the only university that has successfully two, uh, two engagements that uh, executive level time that have been matched with startups. So 
Uh, it's a great program. And last but, not neat, uh, last but not least is our UK pitch. Okay, so what that's designed to do, you say you're a, so you're a researcher and you're saying, hey, I've, I've identified this conference or identified this, uh, this event where I want to be able to pitch my ideas. Okay, I want to be able to pitch, and I think this is a great opportunity um, to showcase as far as what I've been doing. Now, keep in mind, UK Pitch is designed around commercialization and entrepreneurship. So this is not where I want to pitch my research to other researchers to give me feedback. This is, this is pitching to uh, people that can either give you uh, strategic alliances or give you some pats on the back, or it can be some monetary things that's involved into that and get you some exposure in regards to your technology. So, you, so you've identified a conference and you think that this is a good fit for you, we will come in and we will help you with that pitch. We will help you with the communication. We will help you with the slides, help you be more comfortable, uh, and give you the, the best success that you can have when you're going there because you're a representative of the University of Kentucky, all right, and, and, we, invest in, and we invest in you uh, in regards to that. We want you to be successful uh, for whatever that you uh, are, are working on and representative of UK and the technology that, you, that you've been doing. So there's another side piece, uh, side piece of that is that um, also we're able to uh, disp uh, dispense up to $1,000 in order for that, in order for you to go to those type of conferences. So that's a good benefit as well. So that can be the cost for you getting down there or registration costs and those type of things. So uh, without further ado, if anybody got any other questions or concerns, I think I'm, think I'm done. Hope I wasn't going too fast. <laughs> but uh, again, I'm Emmanuel. If you guys got any questions, uh, you know, just let me know. All right. Thank you, Emmanuel. So now the fun part. So we've got a panel of um, people who are, some of them are UK researchers. One's a former graduate student and postdoc. He survived that. Um, and so um, they're going to come up, if you'll make your way up here, and tell you about, that's me, <laughs> tell you about um, their experience and uh, their entrepreneurial journey. And we're going to have enough time if you guys have questions from Eric and Emmanuel's presentation and, and the panel also. So first, on your, um, on your left, we have Chase Kapinski. And Chase is the chief scientific officer for a company called Interpret. And he'll tell you a little more about that. Megan Marsak is in the middle. And Megan is assistant professor in pediatrics in the UK College of Medicine. And she represents Selly coping kit, her company. And then last but not least, Janelle Malloy. And Janelle is the professor and director of medical physics, radiation medicine in the College of Medicine. And her company is Wild Dog Physics. So we're going to start with a softball question or, you know, the easy one. So can each of you tell us a um, little bit about your company and about your entrepreneurial journey? How did you get to that company? Sure, I guess I'll start. So I'm Chase Kempinski. Uh, like Tanya said, uh, I was a graduate student at UK, started in 2011, and then defended in 2016. I was in initially the College of Agriculture, and then the lab I was in, Joe Chappelle's lab, moved to pharmacy. And so we finished in pharmacy. That's where I did my postdoctoral work. Uh, and really, our startup was launched out of technology that I worked on as part of my graduate work and postdoc, and that was uh, using yeast, engineered yeast, to produce a compound that's used in personal care and in vaccines, hence pharmaceuticals. Um, it's used as an adjuvant, so it helps boost the immune response to whatever it's co-delivered with. And you don't make antibodies against that. And the oil we're primarily focused on is called squalene, if we want to get into the technical details. Um, we make it, all animals make it. Um, and naturally, and the value proposition was historically it came from shark liver oil for all of those applications. So that was really not sustainable in cosmetics. You don't want products derived from animals. Um, and then the pharmaceutical, they need a large supply for because it, it's used in the flu vaccine. And especially with coronavirus, often we were worried about influenza pandemic. And this can help alleviate um, the burden on developing lots of doses of flu vaccine by using this compound, you can basically spare doses and make your, your difficult part of your vaccine go further. Um, and so we decided to launch a company based on this technology in 
uh, I guess right before I defended, we, we had the idea for it, and so we had participated in an NSF i program in the fall of 2016, and, uh, and then in the January of 2017, we decided we'll launch a company, and then at that point in time, we were able to get a, a small funding mechanism through um, the Kentucky Science and Engineering Foundation, which I don't believe is around anymore, but it was a small grant to do research, and so because we knew our technology needed to be further research and a little more technically developed. And so that supported uh, my postdoc for a year. And then um, after that, during, during that time, we'd applied for SBIR funding to a, a couple different agencies. And then after that, uh, none of things really was panning out. And so I kind of made the leap more into uh, the startup community and engage other startup in Aztec and worked with them um, as a, a VP of research, but analytical chemistry startup, still while doing interpret things. Eventually, we did get a NIH um, STTR, and also we're lucky enough to get a matching grant from the state. So we now have a private space in Aztec where we're doing working on scale up. We have a full time scientist and a part time research technician. So I'm still out and about in the startup community, um, working with Interpreet. Uh, still have a small part time position at UK to help some things in Joe's lab technically, and then um, still engaged in lots of other startups I'm a part of. So I guess that's the the long-winded version for it. <laughs> I'm Megan Marsak. I am trained as a clinical psychologist, and my um, company, The Sally Coping Kit, kind of came out of my passion for trying to improve healthcare for kids and families. So my area of specialization is helping kids and families deal with the emotional aspects and, the, and as well as the logistical aspects of managing really, really difficult medical conditions like cancer, sickle cell disease, really bad injuries, and kind of looking at both the emotional piece of it and like how do you get through needle sticks, how do you get through chemotherapy, those kinds of things. And so I started my company not as a company, as a research project. I'm a researcher at heart as well. Um, back quite some time ago when I was at another institution and then ran it um, more as a research nonprofit, kind of how can we piece these things together. The back end, I would say, is put together with scotch tape as to how it's functioning currently. Um, and then as I joined UK here, reached out to the technology office here, had a meeting with Ian McClure. Um, and he you know, gave me the whole spiel and said, so do you want to do a startup? I said, no. Like, a under no circumstances, no. That's, I'm not interested in that at all. So then he told me about UK's Excel program. And I'm like, yes, I want to learn more. OK, I can, do, I can learn more. Um, so my answer's changed, yes. I'm about to like, launch the company and do the real things. And um, so yes, the new answer. But I was confidently not an entrepreneur about a year ago. So that's my, that's my, quick, my quick story. Is this on? Okay, I guess it is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Janelle Malloy. I'm the uh, director of medical physics uh, in uh, UK's Department of Radiation Medicine. So um, uh, I have a pretty demanding day job, uh, and I've been a medical physicist for 30 years now. Um, and medical physicists are the people kind of behind the scenes. If when people have cancer and need radiation therapy, uh, we have all these big complicated machines, linear accelerators and brachytherapy sources. And so we're basically the geeks behind the scenes that make sure that all of this equipment is doing what it uh, what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and uh, part of what we do, it's mostly clinical service. Um, we do some teaching, but part of what we do is, is research. Um, one of the things I've discovered about myself um, over the last couple of years is, as I've been getting more involved in this, um, and that is that I'm actually really not a researcher at heart at all. I'm strictly a need-to-know kind of person. <laughs> and it's just, I just, uh, I, I'm not driven by, by curiosity or need-to-know, but I am driven by, I can make something work better than this. <laughs> um, and the idea for my company came as I watched my, uh, my students and my staff spend hour after hour after hour just wasting their time. It's not a wasted time, but there's a ton of quality assurance that we have to do on these, uh, on these uh, linear accelerators, and it takes them forever to do it. And most of the time, everything's just fine. So we spend like eight hours a month doing monthly QA, and we just say, okay, it's all good. It's like, Oh, you know. So anyway, so I came up with this um, uh, idea for this device, uh, and then um, approached uh, uh, the uh, the UK OTC and um, talked to Eric Castlin. Actually, I think at the beginning, and he kind of 
lured me in and um, I fell under your spell. I met with Ian and Warren Nash at the time. And um, anyway, so yeah, I just uh, kind of got, got bit by the bug. <laughs> um, and so yeah, I've really had a, a lot of wonderful opportunities over the last couple of years. I participated in the Excel program. Um, they talked me into doing one of these five across pitches, and uh, one of those went well, one of them not so much, so that's, <laughs> that's okay. Um, uh, and then I did the uh, entrepreneur, uh, Entrepreneur's Boot Camp, uh, and that was a great opportunity also. I, that, I don't think that was mentioned here, but um, that would be something for people to do if they wanted to. Um, and then I got, um, my company got invited to be a sponsoring company for um, the one of the uh, uh, course in entrepreneurship that's offered through the Gatton School. So I got to work with David Goodnight uh, on uh, on that. And um, so anyway, so I just learned a ton. Um, everybody who I've been involved with has just been so uh, supportive and helpful. And um, uh, anyway, so 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 I guess what I've really learned through all of this also is is um, I have a very creative side to me also. <laughs> um, and clinical medical physics is not creative at all. It's all <laughs> quality assurance, are you following the rules? Um, so I got myself put on the uh, intellectual property committee also about six months or a year ago. So I get to uh, um, kind of see some of the other inventions coming through. And I've submitted, I think, three, uh, I have two patents that are um, been submitted for full utility patent applications and another provisional patent uh, pending right now so all right thank you so for you guys in the audience you have to be careful about the OTC spell so if you come and talk to us you might just get roped in and and figure out something or uh, find a new way of doing things um, for your career um, so next question is when did you know that you had something that was worth commercializing or do you know that yet <laughs> Go. Uh, that's a, that's a loaded question because it fluctuates day to day. <laughs> um, the best I could, I guess, realistically, was probably in early 2017. After we also did the the UK boot camp at the right around the same time we did the ICOR program, and as part of that, if you're not familiar with ICOR, you really have to go out and engage your customers, and. By doing that, it, it really lets you see where your value proposition will lie in the market. And it just makes you talk to a bunch of people that, like I think Eric mentioned initially, who aren't other researchers and people within the industry. And so at that point, we, we figured uh, if we can do it technically, then there's a business here. That, that's still an outstanding if, though. I think, I think for me, um, I always thought there was something there, at least. Um, when I very first created it, and I didn't describe it very much, um, so we have a coping kit that comes with this critter and this evidence-based tips for parents about how to help their kids cope through different illnesses and kids on like different strategies that they can try. And on the very first time I created it, I was using it with my own patients on my fellowship training. Um, and you just seeing kind of them respond to it, seeing physicians like walk into the room and integrate it right into their medical care. It felt like something was there beyond just, oh, I should just use this with my patients. So I think then like over the years as we've done more research and we've gotten all these amazing kind of feedback from families like Sally's the bomb and there's life-saving tips in here and you know all these kind of different things from our families it you know it's like okay no there's there's definitely something here and then as I went through the UK Excel program looking at the actual market because I hadn't really done that I looked at the research but hadn't really looked at the market I think that was really helpful for me and I am doing UK the boot camp this time, boot camp two currently. I was in boot camp one with some, some um, of UK students last semester. Um, so that's kind of just flushed it out. I think just confirmed along the way the market potential over time. Um, well, again, I don't want to be accused of saying I know it's commercializable. I think it is, OK? <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so I, I'm in a maybe kind of a well, I don't know if it's a, a different position um, than others, but in some ways, were were the um, uh, were you know 
inventing this, we're developing it, we're commercializing it, but also my group basically would are the end customers <laughs> or examples of the end customers. Um, and so I kind of see every day, it's like, oh man, I really wish I could get this thing because <laughs> I see what they struggle with. It's like, okay, if I can just get this optic system, then I can get this into my clinic and I, I know it will help. Um, so I've always kind of had that sense, um, but you know, are we just eluding ourselves? You know, it's like you say, it kind of changes on a, on a moment by moment basis. Um, I uh, have done some, um, uh, Eric Hartman's always beating on me to do my customer discovery interviews, and I hate doing customer discovery interviews, <laughs> but the, <laughs> the few that I, I was forced to do um, uh, were, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, were, uh, were, were pretty positive, um, and I've actually, um, you know, you know a lot of people in the field and have described the, the technology to them, and honestly, I can't count the number of people that have said, I want 10. <laughs> when can I buy one? And I've actually had uh, um, uh, a group that we're working with, a private practice medical physics group down in Arkansas, uh, and the owner of that actually approached me a few months ago and said, I really want some of these. <laughs> Do you have them ready? So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of down to can we really make it work? Because I think the, uh, I think the, uh, the market's there. Great, great. So what has surprised you the most about this entrepreneurial journey that you've been on? Whether it's personal or um, technology related, what, what's been the most surprising? I think for me, the, like, I think one of the things all the pros have helped me see is I had a lot of the skill sets that I needed, but I didn't know how to apply them exactly. So there's a lot of, so I think really just that I can do it maybe has been surprising to me and that I don't have to necessarily get my MBA, even though I have thought about that. Um, I don't necessarily have to have that in order to kind of spin this out into a company and, and just trying to find the right partnerships to make it work. Um, so I think with the right support that it's possible, even though I don't have like a business background. I, I agree with that. I think it's um, oftentimes coming from research, you know, you're, the dogmatic way is you can't say anything unless you're absolutely sure about it, right? Or, you know, if not, you have to give all these caveats. Where in business, it's a lot more nebulous and just sort of breaking yourself and sort of retraining your mind in a way and, and just go do it. Like, don't think about it, just do it, you know? And then we'll deal with whatever else happens later, right? We just got to get this done. Um. Uh, I guess maybe two things. Well, one is actually not that surprising, although it, it maybe gets it beat you over the head a little bit more than you wanted it to, and that's just how long this takes. <laughs> it's you know I feel like I've been beaten on this for a while, and you know prog progress is slow. Um, so uh, anyway, but uh, um, but in in terms of you know sometimes you always have your um, uh, what's that the especially women scientists, the imposter syndrome, right? It's like, oh, my, you know, my inner imposter is like constantly there. Oh, yeah, this is gonna fail. This is no, no way this thing's gonna work. Um, and we've made um, uh, three versions of, of prototypes so far. Uh, and I was able to take them into the clinic and um, get some data and it's like, this thing actually works, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, okay, cool. <laughs> um, so I don't know, maybe for, for those of us that are a little bit uh, ill-confident uh, to start out with, maybe that's the biggest surprise is that maybe it actually will work. Um, so you hit on my next question. So you talked about you're on your third version now. So uh, talk about how you have pivoted from your original idea of what your product or your company was. How, how many times have you pivoted? Sure, um, so I, I, this is a good thing for me to comment on because we have two markets, like I mentioned, right? Uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care, they both use the same product in a way, but both have very different needs regarding it. Um, and so the lab, the biotech lab, if you will, is really focused on pharmaceutical applications. And you know, there's stringencies that are required there. Whereas in personal care, um, much different needs, um, maybe not, doesn't need our high tech, uh, very expensive and research intensive solution. Um, and so as part of the pivot there is trying to demonstrate the value for our product, 
by perhaps launching a parallel brand that utilizes other renewable sources to, to demonstrate a revenue draw on that. And so really thinking instead of just the long slog, the seven, eight year slog of biotech research to commercialization, try to do something a little more along the lines of traditional, oh, we see a niche, let's start a business, let's figure out what we can use now to fill that channel and then demonstrate at least that our long-term research project will have value in the end. Um, I hope that's clear. If not, I can go into it further. Uh, one of the biggest advantages for me, I think, is it's really broadened my thinking. Um, so thinking about how could you take something you did, like just for cancer, and expand it for all these other populations, um, and just and thinking more broadly about what are all the other things that could go along with the original idea. And then I think the other thing that was m maybe more of a shift was I'd originally thought our market was really um, healthcare networks and hospitals and and um, you know doctors' offices and that sort of thing. But I think with everything we've learned al along the way and with the barriers that come along with big institutions, I think the market probably is more parents, friends, grandparents, you know, those kinds of you know targeting that market rather than targeting the giant institution market. Um, <clears throat> well, I guess I've had kind of. Um, Two, two, two pivots uh, to speak of. Um, uh, one was kind of as, as I was developing the device, it's like, okay, well, I can make it do this, and that, that would be add this value and stuff. And then I thought, well, but if I could just make it do this also, then that would. And so the, the, the design goal for the thing became, okay, I need to be able to do every single thing on a monthly calibration in one in one sitting, like in, in 20 minutes. So that was the, the overarching goal. Um, and that's still, but, but the, you know, the initial concept was I'm going to make this QA device and I'm going to sell this QA device. But when you start really thinking about what the value add is for it, um, it's more that you don't need to have some, um, like really expensive medical physicists doing this anymore. You can have a therapist or a tech do this during their morning QA, and because of how the data is presented, um, they don't even have to be there. So it's we've kind of pivoted from <coughs> from building a widget to creating a. a really kind of a new paradigm <laughs> um, could be in um, in terms of radiation therapy QA where um, where physicists can now remotely support um, clinics all over the country if they needed to so um, that didn't really change the design it more changed the focus in terms of what our our value add would be mm -hmm. but the other pivot that we're working on right now is um, you know we, we have not been able to get a big chunk of SBIR money yet so I'm kind of you know self-funding this right now um, and I'm not even allowed uh, sure I'm allowed to sell it because <laughs> of FDA um, but I, I'm actually um, have a meeting with FDA tomorrow. Yay! So um, they're going to give me some guidance there. Um, but also, I'm scaling back rather than this being a company based around one widget. There's a whole slew of five or ten different kind of um, iterations of this thing that I think I could sell also. Um, and the simpler they get the more likely it is that I'm not gonna, going to have to, and depending on how I market it, um, I may not even need FDA clearance, at least to get my foot in the door. So that's where we're pivoting right now. We're starting out with a much more simplified version to just uh, kind of get, get our foot in the door. So those oh, were kind of two great pivots. answers. All right, uh, this next question is somewhat gratuitous, but what kind of support have you guys received along the way <laughs> for, uh, with uh, pro different programs and, and other, you know, mentors or any kind of guidance that you guys have received? Uh, sure. So, like I mentioned, we started out in the entrepreneurial boot camp, which kind of plugged us into everyone at UK OTC. Um, we received the NSF i uh, grant funding mechanism. Um, and then once we really started to engage with OTC, um, at that point, there were a lot of, a lot of these programs were coming online, so participated in UK Excel, which was, really great. We've had a lot of excellent support in terms of licensing the technologies because there are several patents that the technology uh, is, is uh, wrapped up in that UK has. They've been really supportive in that, specifically when it comes to our SBIR funding mechanisms to show that we will have the, the freedom to operate. Um, and then it's ju also just having mentors and engaging other people in the startup community. Uh, they're just friendly individuals willing to share their stories and also who have been through 
the same road that you're trying to navigate and just trying to help you avoid certain pitfalls and then, you know, I guess uh, lending you things that you, information that you wouldn't normally find on a website or in a, in a pamphlet or something like that. Uh, so I have done uh, the UK Excel, the Boot Camp 1, and now Boot Camp 2. Um, so I've tried to hit almost every program offered here at UK. I'm working my way through them all. I apparently I will. I'm encouraged to continue being part of these programs. Um, and then I also think like uh, the OCG, OTC office has been key in helping navigate the relationships between my prior institution and my current institution because this work was started at another institution. So a lot of negotiations and work had to be done to make it work so that I could continue working on it here as well and to potentially be able to license it to myself from UK as well. Um, so I had a lot of support around that. I've also had um, Eric Hartman from the OTC office has also set aside time and helped me not get lost along the way because I think it's, it seems like there's just so many pieces of things. And I'm very good at following directions and checking things off lists, but knowing where to start and, you know, and not getting overwhelmed or bogged down in the details. Um, I think they've been really helpful to make sure I haven't fallen over while I've tried to navigate everything as well. Um. <coughs> Yes, well, I, I, um, yeah, I mean, e everybody involved in the OTC and Excel and every is just absolutely wonderful. I mean, you could not ask for uh, a better group of people. Um, they're so knowledgeable. They're so supportive. Um, I, there, there hasn't been any aspect of this where you can't just go and, and people just know what they're doing and they're they're extremely helpful. Um, for for me, um, you know, I kind of feel like this, it, it's kind of a, it's kind of heavy lift to get this thing off the ground. You know, there's technology, there's intellectual property, um, you know, there's FDA and, and all of this stuff. And so it can kind of feel overwhelming. Um, but, um, you know, Eric Hartman is always, and you mentioned it before, you know, talking about, um, you know, de-risking your company and your and your concept. Um, and so it can be very overwhelming. Well, what should I work on? Should I, you know, tweak this optical system or should I, you know, call it? And so when I, you know, when you think about, okay, what do I need to, to de-risk this? It helps add a lot of clarity um, actually to the process. Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah, and in terms of getting the, uh, so in terms of de-risking, making sure that the intellectual property is, um, uh, is protected, making sure that uh, WildDoc has ownership over it, uh, working with FDA, making sure it works, um, things like that. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you guys are awesome. So they answered the question correctly. <laughs> so I have one last question, and then I want to open it up for you guys in the audience to ask the panel or if you have questions for Eric or Emmanuel. Um, but the last one is, knowing what you know now, if you could go back to the beginning, what would you do differently? <laughs> uh. That's, that's difficult in the fact that, I mean, there's still so much that I'm learning, you know, every day. And um, I, think the, I think the biggest thing was, kind of what hit on by the other panelists here, is, is just to have the confidence from the get-go. It's hard to, especially when you're stepping into something, an entirely different, you know, discipline, if you will. Um, but, you know, just, just reach out there and engage with more people to learn, to fill in the gaps that you don't have, uh, specifically whether it be in just what's the first step in starting a startup? Like, where do I go on the Secretary of State's website to start a business? You know, it could be something that simple, but there's just so many little things that you can get bogged down with that um, aren't that big of a deal, right? So I guess that's, that's it. I, this might sound kind of strange, but I, actually I think it's good. The path's been good. I, I think the timing for me has worked out. The Everything I learned prior to walking into the OTC's office prepared me to kind of move forward with things. Um, I think too professionally, I am now tenured, so I have a little bit more freedom to pursue different like activities as well. Um, so I think the timing of it, which wasn't planned, we, I could pretend that was planned, it wasn't planned. It all kind of just kind of fell into place with the timing of it and like professionally, kind of where it hit in my kind of path along the way, um, it fits. The other thing I think that's been really awesome for me, I, this might not be in direct response to your question, but sorry, um, is that going through this process has also changed my other professional life. It's given me, um, helping me change the way I present things as well um, in my research and 
I'm a grant writer as well, so I just thinking about the way you think about things from this kind of perspective has also influenced my other presentation and influenced the way I manage some of the other parts of my job. So I think that's been like something I wasn't expected that kind of, you know, but that, again, that wasn't a mistake. That's an advantage or not something I do differently. I think it all really aligned for me, so I feel very fortunate. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess I, I would have to say the same thing. I, uh, you know, I, I'm not one of these people that looks back and says, well, I shouldn't have done that. You know, it's, uh, I guess I knew when I started this that it was going to be kind of a long process and that there's no way you can predict what's going to work and what's not going to work. And you just have to, you just have to point yourself in that direction and kind of keep, keep schlogging away. Um, and I, I remember, uh, David Goodnight. Um, said uh, something like, what, what does it take to be an entrepreneur or to be a successful entrepreneur? And, and, you know, you always hear these stories of, oh, you know, I quit my job and I worked 400 hours a week and I lived out of my mom's basement and all that. You know, I'm thinking, I'm sorry, I'm not just not doing that. Um, but, uh, but he said it, it just takes um, a, a persistent, moderate pressure. Um, and I thought, I can do that, <laughs> you know, and so it's it's been a path of persistent, moderate pressure, and I, I guess we're making progress. So I don't know what I'd do it differently. You just got to start and do the best you can. All right. Thank you, panel. Uh, does anyone in the audience have a question for our panel or other presenters? Oh, come on. <laughs> no questions. I'm going to give you the mic because we're recording this. <laughs> so how much thought did you put into the naming of your companies? Because they're all uh, maybe some are more descriptive than others, and some are a little, I guess, more different than I would think. My company's still not named. Oh, okay. That's the product, so I keep you know, talking as if that's the name of the company. That's like the signature product that will be under the company. So a lot, that's actually been a huge barrier for me, <laughs> picking a name. So, I, I mean, I've debated lots of different things. I think for me, I want something that's fairly descriptive because when you think about people Googling things and looking things up, most likely my product is going to be found by like parents of kids who are Googling online. So for me, I want the company name to align with the products that will fall under it. Um, so I'm still working on it. Any ideas are welcomed. Uh, so we had a different name that we ended up initially, like during the 2016, that we couldn't use, and so we needed to come up with one relatively quick. And uh, it's kind of cheesy, but since we make terpenes, our name is just terpene backwards, since we're turning around the availability of terpenes. Um, well, so um, I, the name of my company is Wild Dog Physics, as you see. Um, what on earth that has to do with radiation therapy QA devices, I have no idea. <laughs> um, uh, but we also uh, are registered as doing business as medical physics innovations. And so I remember trying to decide what to name my company. And I actually remember talking to Eric Hartman about it. And I said, I don't know, you know, should I do medical physics innovations? It's, you know, it sounds a lot more mature and serious or should uh, or or um, should I do wild dog physics because we're in the land of the wild cats uh, and I have this cute little puppy named Holly and she's crazy and so I thought instead of everything's wild cat physics I think it should be wild dog physics and so I just remember saying I don't know should I do medical physics innovations or I should do wild dog physics and Eric said I like wild dog physics, so so we just went with wild dog physics. Um, I I have uh, recently, um, just uh, about a week ago, got a website uh, up and running, and I am branding it more as medical physics innovations. So I actually kind of have two brands. Medical physics innovations is going to be the serious company that does this device, and you know I'll probably start you know sharing equity and getting investors at some point. I'm willing to kind of sell that off. Wild Dog Physics is my journey away from academics and into being an entrepreneur and a creative person. Um, and I actually, um, one of the other things that I want to do is to make um, educational scientific videos with 3D animation and modeling. Uh, and so I'm doing that right now. So I'm going to be starting to do some stuff uh, under Wild Dog Physics also. So, uh, you know, you got to have some fun. <laughs> Great. 
Any other questions? So I, I think about a lot of the uh, idea development as being related to IP, being related to uh, knowing how to figure out if you have IP related issues. And I think of my coming to an office and they saying, yeah, go out there and troll the patent logs, whatever, and then figure out if you've got something and then come back. I think about a lot of the homework that may be associated with you three individuals and each of you don't have JDs apparently, but I think of a lot of IP related being a JD and how the heck do I figure out whether my one idea is something. Is there some, you know, are it, it, you know anybody sitting in the crowd like myself, am I looking at spending the next six months trolling IP logs and pretending to be a JD? And then the second half of that would be thinking about uh, in relation to the um, uh, company naming stuff. It was the was one of the immediate recommendations that you go out there and spend five dollars for a website URL to protect it so that somebody else doesn't grab the same thing. Go to OTC. Yes. I, that, that was for your for your IP, like yeah. so they we'll they that. will help you figure all that out. Like we, if you have an idea, we do that so that you don't have to. So. When you have a disclosure and submit it to our office, we'll go through and we'll look at all the, the patent landscape to see what's out there and, and where you can operate. And we'll do a market assessment for you um, to look at what other companies are working in this area. Are they strategic partners that you could uh, work with? Or is it somebody that could potentially acquire you down the road? So we, we do all of that upfront assessment work for you. You don't have to have the JD. We've got JDs in our office, <laughs> so <laughs> so you don't have to do that. And yes, domain name. They said, yeah, if you think you might want that name, go buy it and save it. And copyright it and trademark it too, if you like that. Yeah. Well, no, you yeah you, you you buy the domain names and then the 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 company name you can copyright those and you can trade have them trademarked also like if you have a logo or something. So th this question, I guess, is more for Chase, but I guess it, it will extend to 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 all of you. How has this journey affected your training and how you interact with uh, the institution? Uh, I'm thinking, and the reason I'm I'm pointing you out is because you were you were doing this during your training and the expectations of your training might have changed, and I wasn't, I'm wondering if you were the driver behind this or if your PI was the driver behind this. Sure, um, so I was the primary driver behind this. Um, the PI I was under, and um, he's co-founder of the company as well, um, had previous experience and very supportive of entrepreneurial activities. Um, and so it was, we had a, you know, a frank discussion as I was wrapping up my dissertation that it was, this was something I'd wanna pursue. And so my whole postdoctoral training, if you will, was kind of focused around trying to translate a technology from the lab to the marketplace, with that being the end goal, right? Um, and then, you know, when the f academic funding ran out, like I mentioned, you know, that was kind of on me to figure out, you know, and then I think if there's anything about the life of an entrepreneur at this stage, it's just you have to be comfortable with uncertainty. And so that's, that's where I live now and just have to, you know, delicately balance all the different hats to keep my lights on and to keep everybody else happy, right? So. Yeah, so for some of you, if you're researchers and uh, you come up with an idea and you have a graduate student in your lab that could work on this and then take it forward, that's actually something that we recommend. We don't really wanna lose all of our researchers uh, as having them become entrepreneurs um, because what you do best is research. But a lot of times you may have a graduate student or a postdoc that's working in your lab that could has the time uh, to take that forward. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. We need you on record. <laughs> this is to Janelle. Um, before I started with OTC, I just want you to know that I got on their website to review um, what they do and everything, and your wild dog physics was the first thing that my attention went to. It was an article about your company, and it really drew my attention to you, so I just compliment that it was a very um, great name because, you know, it, it has to be catchy, you know, catch someone's eye for some reason. So it was very, that's the reason I read it first. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? No one else? Well, let's give our panel a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you all. 
And if any of this piqued your all's interest and uh, you want to come and talk to our office, um, we, um, you can reach out to us individually. We also have our website down here. We are uh, very active on social media, so please like and follow us. And we also, how many of you guys are subscribed to our newsletter? That's it. Okay, so we have a newsletter <laughs> that comes out monthly, and um, it has a lot of good information in there about the programs that we have and some of the other um, entrepreneurial activities that are going on. Uh, we do spotlights on uh, researchers and companies, so a really good source of information. And if you go to our website, you can uh, link the subscribe button and get our newsletter um, every month. So I suggest that you guys do that. And thank you all for being a great audience, and um, have a good day. <laughs>